Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi. My guest today is the oldest head of government in the world. Malaysia's Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad came back to office in May after a shock election victory against his own former ruling coalition. The country has been mired in allegations of corruption swirling around the previous government, which has dented confidence at home and abroad. First time around, Mahathir was Prime Minister for more than 20 consecutive years until 2003. Can he leave his own chequered past behind him and lead Malaysia to a brighter future? Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Extraordinary return to power in May for you after 15 years of retirement. What made you want to return to government? Uh, people came to me frequently, groups of people, asking me to please do something about a government which uh, they found not uh, the kind of usual government. It's very oppressive, it's very corrupt. So you've got this um, big corruption case against the former Prime Minister, Najib Razak, um, in connection with 1MDB, which is the state sovereign fund. $680 million missing. Um, he says he was given that by the Saudi royal family and that he's done nothing wrong. And when there was a case against him when he was Prime Minister, he was cleared of all charges. You seem to think he's already guilty. I, well, that's his excuse that he got it free from Saudi. But nobody ever gives that amount of money to anybody. How do you know? In the history of the world. How do you know? Well, I have never read of anybody getting that kind of money. Have you asked the Saudis whether they did or not? Well, uh, the Saudis, if they have given him uh, money when it moves, leaves a trail behind their documents, show the documents that the money was in their bank, and then the bank uh, send the money over, and how did they get the money in the first place? So his properties, um, uh, properties connected to him, have all been raided, and $28.6 million in cash was found, plus 430 designer handbags belonging to his wife. And you said, it is obvious that he has stolen money. Shouldn't you really leave all this to the courts? Well, in the first place, uh, the Americans, the Department of Justice, Found, uh, made that statement that the money was stolen from 1MDB. They wouldn't have made that statement unless they have proof, real proof that it was stolen money. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the former Prime Minister Najib Razak stole it. Anyway, I mean, should you not allow the courts well, to carry enough, due process of law? enough for us to put him before the... to charge him, and it's up to the court to decide whether our evidence is correct or his denial is correct. All right, but he has denied this, just yes. to make sure that, that you know that. I mean, what, what the 430 designer handbags, I mean, your, your finance minister, Lim Guan Eng, says, realistically, the hopes of recovering 30% of the money misappropriated, that's all you can hope for. You're not going to go very far by trying to revivify your economy with the proceeds of 430 designer handbags, are you? No, we are not talking about the handbags alone. We are talking about lots of money, billions of dollars of dollars which has been stolen and is now no, nowhere to be found. All right. When you were Prime Minister, you said um, a couple of years ago in an interview there was corruption that happened when I was Prime Minister, but not on this scale. So do you accept any of the blame yourself for the state of affairs that Malaysia finds itself in now, mired in corruption allegations? If I have to accept the blame, then all governments must accept the blame because uh, this corruption is found everywhere to some degree. There is no country that can boast that it has no corruption at all. But uh, did you perhaps set in motion um, something which we see today? Because after all, you were head of this ruling coalition, mm -hmm. which has been in power for more than 60 years. Mm -hmm. Najib Razak was somebody that you thought would be a good prime minister. So you were part of the system. No, the system may be the same, but the man is different. 
Uh, I mean, that system has had four prime ministers, five prime ministers before him. In the, in, there is no accusation of, um, my, uh, of corruption at, on that scale against all those four. But the system can be abused. And what he did was to make his, use his authority to steal money. Allegedly, as I keep on saying, Prime yeah. Minister, mm -hmm. Najib Razak says he is not guilty. He's entirely innocent. But in the time that you were Prime Minister, a book about you by the Wall Street Journal's Barry Wayne claimed that 100 billion ringgit, that's about tens of billions worth of dollars, went missing under your watch. That's a lot of money. Well, at that time, they, kept, they didn't prove that I took any money. Well, we did lose money because uh, some of our people get involved in uh, trading in currency and they lost money. It wasn't, it wasn't me. I, I couldn't take the blame for somebody doing, uh, being corrupt. So you haven't benefited yourself personally living a lavish lifestyle or anything like uh, that? They have seen my house, they have seen my lifestyle and they know I don't live lav lavishly like the, president, the last Prime Minister. So, Najib Razak was somebody you had approved of, as I said, and some of his predecessors like Abdullah Ahmed Badawi and Anwar Ibrahim, of course, who was your deputy prime minister when you were in power. 1998, you pushed him out as deputy prime minister. It is said because he was pointing to um, state contracts which were being awarded to some of your cronies. That's what he said at the time, and you thought, hmm, don't want this man hanging about really so the, we saw the case against him he says trumped up charges of sodomy do you really think he was guilty of sodomy well the courts decided that he was guilty and sentenced him to jail it wasn't me uh, the, what he says about uh, uh, this ac accusation is his opinion his explanation uh, whether it is trumped up or not it's up to the court to decide, up to the prosecutors and the defence. But he De suffered terribly. He had spent six years at first, in total the best part of a decade, but six years at first in solitary confinement, denied access to his children. He's a father of six. <laughs> and, um, you know, even when he was released in 2004, when you were no longer prime minister, you continued your tirade against him. You said, imagine having a gay prime minister. Nobody would be safe. <laughs> That's what you said. Well, that's what I said at that time, but it was necessary for me to work with him to oust the, the Najib as Prime Minister. So both of us decided to forget about the past because this is far more important and we focus on that issue and nothing else. So after he was released now, on, uh, after a royal pardon, he told the BBC in June that um, Mahathir Mohammed told him that he had made a mistake and that he wants the chance to make amends. That's what you told him. Well, so that is his opinion. Well, that's that what he said you told him. Oh, I didn't tell him that. You didn't? I didn't tell him, you... but other people put words into my mouth because they want me to apologize. But I have never made any formal apologies to him. You, haven't, you don't regret what happened to him? Well, I regret that he has to go to jail, but the and fact not is... And seeing his children and all no, the No, I can't take the blame for his jailing because it was decided by the courts. It was done, not done by me. But do you feel sorry for him that he went through what he did? Well, I feel sorry for people who have, who have uh, I mean, done something and been sentenced to... Uh, mm to jail by the, well, by the court. It's interesting because this is his exact quote, he said, because uh, he's reassured his supporters of your transformation. Because, you know, a lot of people were upset about what happened to Anwar Ibrahim when you were prime minister. He says, Mahathir has proven his tenacity, accepted past limitations, apologized, and sacrificed his time and energy to raise the dignity of the people and the country. You've brought Wan Aziza, Anwar Ibrahim's wife, as your deputy prime minister. So, is all this not true that you didn't apologise, you didn't express regret? The regrets. matters were not discussed. After that, we were concentrating on getting rid of Najib. All right. So, he says he's also raised with you the fact that you have brought back some of the old guard into your government. And he has said, look, I I'm concerned about this. And that you said to him, 
I need these people because I need them to carry out the reforms that we want to. If he joins the government and becomes a prime minister, that would be an old guard also. Because he was with me as deputy prime minister for a very long time. So if I cannot bring back people who, who have served me, then uh, I think uh, I will have to rely on people with no experience. And these people who join me, they have the same opinion about Najib's government. So they want to join together, form a coalition, and contest against Najib. So, all right, you're bringing back some of these old faces, as I said, Muhyiddin Yassin, the Home Minister, your son Mukharis is the Chief Minister of Estate, and Daim Zainuddin is head of the Council of em Eminent Persons, your, your advisors. Mm -hmm. so, so, so these are some of the old faces from your old government. And you, when you were in power until 2003, the criticisms are that you launched uh, vigorous attacks on the judiciary, you used internal security Act to repress um, dissent and to go against, you know, people who opposed you. Yeah. So, I mean, should we be nervous? No. Why shouldn't I say something against people who are against me, the opposition? And as for my son, he was not allowed to go into politics until I resigned, until I was no longer the prime minister. Then only he became the chief minister, not during my time. I don't allow any of my children to go into politics while I was still the Prime Minister. You make it seem as though, because you know you were described as one of Asia's strong men and that your rule was sometimes repressive. Let me give you an example. In the South China Morning Post, Lynette Ong, who's a professor of political science at the University of Toronto, says, I grew up in Malaysia during the Mahathir Mohamed era when the country was part of the coveted Asian Tigers Club that boasted strong economic growth, yet much of the prosperity came at the expense of curbed political expression and restricted civil liberties. Over a long period, the law and judiciary in instead of delivering justice, have been used by the government as a weapon against political opponents and dissidents. That is her opinion. Has she done any study about how I've been accused of being a, a, a dictator? No, you know, no dictators have ever resigned. I resigned, and now I come back. After more than 20 years in power? Yes. That's I'm, a long enough time. Well, we need time to develop a country. You know, it's not so easy just like flicking your finger, fingers. All right, so do, so she's talking about the, you know, using some of the laws of the state. I'll ask you this then, will you revoke the Sedition Act and the Security Offences Act which have been used to suppress freedoms? The same laws were in existence before I became Prime Minister mm -hmm. and the first, second and third Prime Minister used the same laws to detain people, but nobody, nothing is said about that. Why, why is it that when I do it, it becomes wrong? Well, I'm asking you now because you're sitting in front of me on hard talk, and so I'm putting it to you. If I had a chance to talk to them, I'd ask them that too. So but will I you... I have to give you the background. But will you, will you revoke the Sedition Act the, and the, the sedition Act has, Security Offences Well, Act? the Sedition Act is still there. The ISA, Internal Security Act, which allows the Prime Minister of the government to detain people without trial was there when I was there. It's not been uh, uh, repealed, and, but we have another law which is even worse to replace that law which was repealed. And that was done by my predecessor. The, the, the concern is that as Amnesty International said, that Pakatan Harapan, your Alliance of Hope, as it's known in Malay, came to office on a wave of goodwill amid hope that true progress on human rights was coming to the country. The danger now is that human rights will slowly recede as a priority the longer you are in power. Is it receding as a priority? You seem to just bat it away. You know, journalists write things about what they heard other gen journalists write. They what? don't do any investigation. We have abolished the ISA, but the previous government has uh, uh, in enacted a worse law, uh, which allows him to detain people even without declaring a state of emergency. So these are the true facts. Before journalists uh, right, they invariably read about... Uh, well, this is not journalists. I mean, Amnesty International 
has recently issued a review of your government's first 100 days in office. And in May, it reported, for example, that you are a defender of Malaysia's retrograde affirmative action, which gives all sorts of benefits and advantages to the Malay, ethnic Malay people in your country. You're about 32 million people, 60% of them are ethnic Malays. Yeah. All sorts of advantages, housing, um, jobs, and, and so on and so forth. Why won't you stop this affirmative action? Why should I stop? The thing is, we are trying to co correct the, the disparity in wealth between the Malays and the others. We have to bring up the Malays so as to be as, as wealthy or as well off as the others. That needs correction because if you allow disparity to go by itself, it becomes bigger and bigger. And then there will be tension in the country, there will be even fighting in the country. But it's creating tensions now with the other ethnicities <laughs> in Malaysia. You well, I mean, you look at the brain drain <laughs> of ethnic Chinese Malays. You know, they've left about a third of um, Malaysia's one million strong diaspora are, are highly skilled migrants, many of them ethnic Chinese. They're voting with their feet. Yeah, because they find better jobs elsewhere. They're welcome to go, but many of them are very loyal to Malaysia. Last, yesterday, I had lunch with, with them, and they are all waving Malaysian flags, although they have been part of the diaspora of, of Malaysians in other countries. So, I mean, I accept that your coalition has got, um, the, for example, the Chinese-dominated Democratic Action Party is part of your um, coalition, but you can categorically say that affirmative action in favour of the ethnic Malays who you say need it is not going to result in discrimination against Malaysia's other ethnic communities. No, there's been no discrimination because if you go to Malaysia, you will find that the so-called uh, victims of uh, this uh, policy are now the richest people in the world, in, in Malaysia. Right, so you talk about the richest people in Malaysia, talking about riches in Malaysia, countries in a bit of a bad state, very high level of debt, 54% of GDP, you've got a huge funding gap, you can't do all the things that you want to do, trying to woo international investors and so on. But one very eye-catching policy you've made is to cancel $23 billion worth of infrastructure projects backed by China and also Singapore. And, and this has caused you know, some concern amongst international investors that you've done this. You've referred to what you call as debt colonialism on the part of the Chinese. Are you worried about the Chinese I, being I a didn't colonial? I accuse the Chinese. I merely said that there are other forms of colonialism, and one of them was uh, neo-colonialism, which was coined by President Sukarno. That's what I said. I didn't accuse the but Chinese. President Sukarno of Indonesia. So of yeah, former. Um, are you worried about the Chinese, though, when you say a new form of colonialism? Is that who you're pointing the They're finger at? They're still coming. They still want to invest in Malaysia. They've seen me, many of them have seen me, even recently, and they don't seem to be uh, in any way... You don't want Chinese people coming to settle in Malaysia? No, no country wants other people to come en masse to, to their country and settle there. Is Look at what's happening in Europe now. Do you think that's they going to affect... Te they are uh, telling all the Syrians to go away because you know, and Donald Trump has, has uh, built a big uh, wall against Mexico. Is it because you don't want another... Uh, where you don't want ethnic Chinese living in Malaysia to it's upset the It's not Chinese. Them? Even if it is Sudanese, they are welcome. Yeah, but, <laughs> but if you come... By the millions, sorry, no entry. You've also referred to the South China Seas in your recent United yes. Nations speech. And, of course, we've got a big dispute there between China and some of its Asian neighbours, Malaysia, the Philippines, and so on. Are you worried that China is flexing its muscles there? I know all. OK. In your UN speech, you also talked about the worsening plight of the Palestinians, as you described it. And whilst many would agree with you on that particular statement, they wouldn't agree with your stance on Jews in the world. And the Israeli press, for instance, has described you as a proud anti-Semite. Um, would you accept that, that you are an anti-Semite? There are many races in this world, 
I have said nasty things about them. They never accuse me of being anti this and anti that. But the Israelis are special. You cannot even mention that in the Holocaust, it's not six six million, but four million who were victims of the Holocaust. That is anti. Anti-Semitic. Well, all right. Well, let me tell you about what you said at a conference in 2010, according to reports in the British press. Even after, this is what you said about the Jews. Even after their massacre by the Nazis, Jews survived to be a source of even greater problems to the world. In 1970, in your book, The Malay Dilemma, you said the Jews are not merely hook-nosed, but understand money instinctively. These kinds of things are not acceptable, are they? Prime Minister? Well, lots of people say nasty things about us, Malays, lady, and all kinds of things, but I didn't take it up against them. That is an opinion. And I gave my opinion of things. Do you stand by that, those sorts of opinions? Well, if you are going to be truthful, the problem in the Middle East began with the creation of the State of Israel. That is the true, whole truth. But I cannot say that. Why is it that you cannot... Uh, but why say hook-nosed and good with money? It's not they, necessary, they, they is it? They are hook-nosed. Right. Well, I'm sure that many people would really find yeah, that very can, offensive. Many people call the Malays fat nose. We did not object. We didn't go to war for that. Right. OK. Um, we're coming to the end of this interview. At 93, Mahathir Mohammed, with all respect, do you have the energy and vision to take Malaysia forward and accomplish the reforms that are needed to set the country on a new path of prosperity? I try. I will try. And I think my last stint as Prime Minister did not result in people condemning me for not developing the country. They even called the country an Asian tiger during my last stint. Now I've been asked to do something. I will try. When will you stop? Two years and hand over to Anwar Ibrahim? Yes. As has been reported? If that is what the nation wants, I'll stop. But I have made a promise. I will stick by my promise. Two years and then you'll step down at 95? Yes. Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you.